typical call, National City had the highest violent crime rate. I believe it still does. And it was called Nasty City back then. It was a lot of gang activity. So the typical, there was a lot of violence. We were, we were, we weren't going, we weren't responding to calls. We weren't going normal speed. We were hauling ass everywhere and snapping our lights to get through intersections and I mean, the gang fights. Mike Ellis was uh, dispatched to one gang fight, ran into another one, shot a guy on the one on the way to the other one. I, ro- I rolled off 300 Highland meeting with one cop and said, okay, I'm getting back to my beat. I rolled northbound on, on uh, Highland, cross division, went up uh, into San Diego, uh, on, where the street there, the way it divided. And the left side at that point was San Diego. The right side was still National City. So I'm going northbound on the right side it's now 43rd Street, and a, somewhere just around 43rd and Delta, there's a little corner there. I rolled right into a freaking gang fight. I put it in park, lit the thing up, made them think the cavalry arrived, and I bailed out the passenger side. And and when the when they all scattered, there were two bodies in the in the parking lot. I mean, it was violent, a lot of violence. <laughs> Okay, so for the audience, a little bit unique situation. I I haven't decided which one is going to go first, but I've got two brothers. I interviewed uh, Mike Chavarria already in Texas, and now I'm interviewing uh, Carlos Chavarria down here in San Diego. So, you know, one of the reasons for this channel is just to figure out why people go into law enforcement in general. So it'll be very interesting to compare and contrast the two brothers here and why uh, each one of them decided to go into law enforcement. So uh, can you introduce yourself for me, please? Uh, my name is Carlos Chevaria. Okay. Um, and, and, and Carlos, where did you, for law enforcement purposes, where did you serve? Uh, National City PD. National City PD. Okay. So when did you begin with uh, National City? I was hired in, I want to say, this is, you know, recollection. I was hired in about November of 77. Okay. Uh, handed a badge, but I couldn't carry a gun. <laughs> I was to start the academy, I think it was in January or February of 78. Okay. And I turned 21 in, in February. Okay. So I was 20 when I was hired, and then, but I would turn 21 before I hit the street because National City required you to be 21. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of background with you um, because I, I think your, your, your background is really fascinating. Um, but before we get there, can you tell me a little bit about your family? Uh, how many siblings you have, mom and dad? Give me a background about what it was like growing up for you. Well, you know, I don't say this disrespectfully. I say it, you know, with, with respect that my mother had <clears throat> six kids with four different men. And so I have four half sisters. Uh, two of them are passed on and the other two are around and the one I most close to doesn't like to be called a half sister she's a sister but they're all older than me so but by the time i came along um i was an only child until my brother was born the other the girls were all gone but but i have them and then on my dad's side i have three sisters uh, from costa rica and uh, one is passed on one's up here and one remains in costa rica um my parents were both uh my dad was uh uneducated um uh, Fisherman from Costa Rica, from coastal Costa Rica, Punta Arenas. And my mom was uh, a Depression era uh, child. My, uh, her father, my grandfather, was a bit of a grifter, uh, ran a speakeasy called the Northern Lights in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Jack, <laughs> Uncle Jack uh, did seven years in state prison for uh, manslaughter uh, because he. he guy tried to hijack the load, bring in uh, Canadian whiskey down uh, to the speakeasy uh, in San Francisco. Wow. And I only found that out when we were visiting him in Utah, because my mother's side of the family are, were Mormons, from the grandmother to the great-grandmother, came over with Brigham Young and all that shit. And um, she used to tell the story about Uncle Jack, uh, you know, going away to this job. And I always thought, what's this story about? Going? Why is she always telling it? Well, what, Uncle Jack was three days before his death. He was he was being irrigated, you know. He had uh, he had um, uh, lymphoma of some kind, you know, and he passed away three days later. When we went, I took my mom up to visit him in Salt Lake. He was just spilling his guts, you know, boom, 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 all life, you know, shit. 
And suddenly he t talks about the time he was hauling a load of booze down. And I, my mom had already told me my grandfather was, <laughs> was uh, running a speakeasy because she told me the time I'm looking out the window. They lived on Golden Gate Way in an old Victorian looking out and seeing guys breaking into the garage to steal the booze. So I dovetail that with Uncle Jack and I, I'm looking over at my mom and I'm going, <laughs> she's just looking straight ahead. Anything that embarrassed her, she made bullshit. She made shit up. Anyway, so uh, we Linda, grew up in Linda Vista, Kearney Mesa, uh, lived in apartments. We were poor. My dad was, you know, got injured, had a heart attack. Uh, he, was a, he was a fisherman during that industry. He became a merchant seaman. Uh, we had friends who were fishermen and then loggers up in, in uh, uh, or around the Oregon coast. I mean, so I was around longshoremen, loggers, fishermen, merchant seamen, guys missing eyes and fingers and shit like that. And, uh, you know, uh, there were no lawyers and doctors and it wasn't like that. Uh, our neighborhood, my brother-in-laws, my two brother-in-laws, one was, had been in the Navy, the other guy had been in the Marines. But when, his, when, when Pat, my sister, had a, a kid, he wouldn't let him back in the Marines, so he went in the Army and then did a career in the Army. Um, so we grew up in a neighborhood of uh, uh, enlisted military. Um, so there were always Marines, Navy, Ar not Army, but Marines and Navy around. Um, and, and, you know, dock workers and fishermen and stuff like that. So I used to read books when I was a kid. Uh, well, anyway, I don't mean to go on here. What's your next but, question? But was, there, was, there something, was there something growing up that... that made you go, hey, I want to go into law enforcement. You know, you know that song, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a little bit of cowboy in, you know, cowboy's not riding a horse. Cowboy's sort of a, an attitude. And uh, um, I, I wasn't a kid who liked playing football, but I was a kid who liked playing army. And I was a kid, kid who liked to play cops and robbers. And I was a kid who read biographies about Lee Erickson and and Amelia Earhart and, and George Patton. And I always thought, I want to do adventurous stuff. And, and I mixed in with the wrong kids. There was a time when I was a teenager where I was riding motorcycles, stealing motorcycles. We were, we were like a com little freaking commercial enterprise. <laughs> but there's no honor among thieves. And I met which, uh, a, a guy who later became my closest brother without, you know, of, of another mother, and my brother Mike knows him, and is very close to him too, Warren E. Rhodes III. And um, Ed was my, my sort of like, you're going to do the right thing, right, Carlos? I go, yes, I am, Ed. I'm going to do the right thing. And, and I'll tell you, it, and so I liked the action, and I liked the idea of doing the right thing, even though I ventured into the realm of criminal conduct. Um, and so... I wanted to have an adventurous life. I wanted to explore. I wanted to go places very few people go, do things very few people do. You know, I grew up watching, my, my dad took me to a movie, uh, The Devil's Brigade with William Holden, the first special service force. And I thought, that's badass, man. I want to do that shit. <laughs> and then Adam 12, God damn, I want to ride, that's cool shit. And then watch these movies. I, I, I thought, yeah, I, mm, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so that's just kind of what got me into it. And that's it. How much, uh, you're the older brother. How much older are you than Mike? Four and a half years. Okay. Yeah, so rounded up to five. When he was five, I was 10. You okay. know, when he was 10, I was 15. So I was always, we weren't growing up. We weren't really, really in the same, you know, he was, a, a five years is a big difference at yeah. that time. So. But, but I take it you guys are close. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As we got older, you know, I mean, uh, when I was a cop, he became a, um, well, we started, we studied martial arts together. Mm -hmm. And we'd work out like six days a week. Uh, the dojo guy, the Japanese guy gave us a key to the dojo. We'd go in on our own. Mm. And, um, and then when I was a cop, Mike uh, uh, became a, an explorer scout. And he'd ride, come down, ride out with the cops. And then later he got a job there as a, as a police service officer, not a, not a, not a gun-toting enforcement person, but a person who uh, sometimes there's a burglary, residential, uh, and someone would call, and it's all done, it's just do a report, and he would go out and take the reports. He'd be a police service officer. So that was a way of supplementing and taking additional reports where you didn't have immediate, you know, there's something going on, I need cops to go there. Okay. So he got, he got introduced to that. Okay, so 
you both end up going to the military, although different branches. Mm -hmm. um, you go into what branch? I went in the army. Okay. And so you were in the army for how many years? Okay, a little bit of story. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't realize until an old friend came back into town. Um, I won't say his name because I don't know if he wants his privacy violated. <laughs> but his first name is Brian. And Brian came into town, Ed and I, Brian, and a guy named Bill Fargo. I think it was Bill. I think it was last name Fargo. Uh, Brian reminded me he came into town for breakfast. And, that, and he, he reminded me that I'm the one who talked other three guys into joining the Army. <laughs> I don't want to go alone. And we we're going to do the buddy program. And it, it just it just fell apart. You know, we, we got as far as uh, uh, the medical we went up to uh, AFIS up in LA, and, and uh, Brian didn't pass the medical, so he, he got busted. He you know he splintered out. It wasn't his fault, and we felt sorry for him. Geez, Brian, you know you can't go in the army. Well, uh, then um, Ed, we were supposed to go 82nd Airborne. We don't want to jump out of airplanes and, and stuff like that. You know. So Ed comes into work one day. We we're both working at the uh, food basket foot, uh, foot of Crystal Pier back then in Pacific Beach. And I'm bagging groceries, you know, as a teenager. And Ed comes in, and he quits. So I'm quitting. I go, what? What are you doing? He goes, I'm going in. I'm going in. He got into a fight with his girlfriend. And he was, he was, you know, I'm going in. <laughs> I go, whoa, wait, you know. So he, so I'm going, oh, shit, now what am I going to do? Well, he came back from a leave, and he said, whatever you do, just go in for two years. Because at the time, they were transitioning. We were the first of the vo all volunteers. The draft was two years. So to entice people to come in, they were offering two-year enlistments with full GI benefits. You know. Yeah. So why do three when you can do two, you know? Yeah. And, and plus, Ed is now coming back from basic telling me, don't do three. And I'm going, well, shit, I'm not going to do three, goddammit. <laughs> so I enlisted for two. And Fargo kept going. Fargo went to, went, uh, he, he was 82nd Airborne, jumped out of airplanes, 11 Bravo uh, infantry, all that stuff. And so, so then, yeah, so I joined for two years. Okay. So you get out and I'm assuming you're 21 then or? Yeah. Well, I, I, I went in and I was supposed to be an MP and then up at AFIS, they said, well, you know, there are different reasons, uh, but you scored really high in communications. I said, eh, I thought, well, shoot, if I can't be an MP, cause I, I anticipated Ed and I had taken classes at Miramar when we were in high school, you mm -hmm. could go take community college co courses. And I took a fire science and a police science. I didn't know which one I liked more. Once I realized fire science is all about hoses and shit, you know, and axes and cleaning shit. They're always cleaning stuff. I said, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Cop work. A, a guy, Ed remembers, a guy showed up. A guy showed up. The instructor showed up and he was wearing a trench coat and he opened it up. He had all kinds of weapons and shit. And he's pulling shit. I go, wow, look at that. that. Okay, police work. So I thought, well, I'll do two years as an MP if I'm not going to jump out of plane. So, you know, that'd be good, good groundwork. Well, they, you know, oh, you can't do that. But they come up with reasons. They said, you scored really high in communications. So I said, do you, do you qualify for this job? I go, well, what do they do? He goes, well, they work in a comm center. They wear khakis, air-conditioned building. I go, well, shit, if I'm not going to get to do what I want, at least I'll be comfortable. It was all a fucking lie. I went in. <laughs> I ended up the 3rd Squadron, 4th Air Cavalry as a field radio operator. And that's the reconnaissance unit for the division. Wow. We were out in the field all the freaking time. I was part of an aero rifle platoon. The blues is what they called them. <laughs> aero rifle platoon. You got hoodwinked. Went to Recondo school. I wow. don't even know if that exists anymore. It was taught by uh, rangers and army special forces. Oh, wow. We, we, were, we learned and were trained in specific things. That was 28 days. You get out of the army and, you, and you, essentially in 77, you start with the National City Police. Why... Why that P PD? Did, was it was it okay. coming back home? How'd you end up there? Well, when I first got out, I I didn't want anything. To, I had changed my mind. I didn't want anything to do with uniforms. I was sick of, you know, yes sir, no sir, you know, all that shit. I was just tired of it. The military like put a bad taste in my mouth. So I said, I want to be around. And I was always in the field hanging out with dudes, you know. I wanted <laughs> nasty, dirty in the field for freaking days. And so I said, you know what? I want a job where. I'm around pretty girls who smell nice. So I got a, I got a job as a, a bank teller trainee. And I was in their program. And I lasted about a week. And I said, I'm not doing this shit. <laughs> so I got in the, in the yellow pages or white pages. And I started looking and calling 
you know, San Diego PD, San Diego Sheriff. San Diego PD and San Diego Sheriff had just had their tests. I was, hadn't taken the test. And they had, you know, each test is, you know, like 300 people they're going to work through. National City was taking applicants. So I went, it was just by chance. I went down to National City and it was about 300 applicants. And I was one of the people selected. The other guy was a guy named Greg Peters. He'd already been a reserve. So I, you know, I'm going to say with pride, I was chosen a 20 year old out of 298 other applicants. So I got the job. So P Peters and I went to the academy, the San Diego Sheriff's Academy. And, you know, uh, Carlsbad PD. There were guys from Carlsbad also and Coronado. Wow. That would go to the sheriffs. So when you actually start, you go through the training, but when you actually start carrying a gun and on patrol, you're 21, right? Yeah, I'm 21. Okay, so so tell me what your thought thought is. I mean, you know, you got a lot of life experience up at that point or some life experience because of the military. How is it, you know, your first days on patrol as a 21-year-old? Are you scared, nervous? You're too dumb to know any different? Tell me. No, I thought, I thought, well, whoever we go up against, we're trained. They're not most of the time. Their weaponry is about equal to ours. There's no M60. There are no machine guns. There are no grenades. There are no mines. There are no, art there's no artillery, no fucking armor. <laughs> no tanks. I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> you know, we, I mean, it was it wasn't really. Um, uh, there were a couple times. Uh, I'm not saying. Uh, uh, you know, people say, "Well, if you're not scared." Well, I was plenty scared in the army, but this was nothing compared to that. Mm. You, you know what I mean? The yeah. street was different, and I'd had martial arts training. I felt. I felt. I was young. I was in good shape. I always stayed in good shape. I wasn't one of these guys who got didn't ever worked out. And I see some of these cops. I'm going. Seriously, you're going to risk your ass. You're not working out. You're out of shape. Any guy on the street can knock your lights out, you yeah. know? So I always stayed in shape, but I knew I wasn't the biggest guy in the, in, on the street, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to stay in shape and, and just used my training, you know, officer survival training, maintain the advantage, try to anticipate, you know, if, if this, if that, if that, if this, you know, mostly car, car stops, you know, if you stop someone and they get out and they approach you and you tell them to stop, tell them to stop, what are you going to do? Yeah. You can't be thinking about it then. You got to pre-plan, right? Proper planning prevents piss poor performance. They told us that, <laughs> you know. Was it was there a typical call that you were taking back in the day? Typical call. National City had the highest violent crime rate. I believe it still does. And it was called Nasty City back then. It was a lot of gang activity. So the typical... There was a lot of violence. We were we were we weren't going. We weren't responding to calls. We weren't going normal speed. We were hauling ass everywhere and snapping our lights to get through intersections. And I mean the gang fights. Mike Ellis was uh, dispatched to one gang fight, ran into another one, shot a guy on the one on the way to the other one. I roll. I rolled off 300 Highland meeting with one cop and said, "Okay, I'm getting back to my beat." I rolled northbound on on uh, Highland. Cross division went up uh, into San Diego, uh, on, where the street there, the way it divided, and the left side at that point was San Diego. The right side was still National City. So I'm going northbound on the right side. It's now 43rd Street, and a, somewhere just around 43rd and Delta, there's a little corner there. I rolled right into a freaking gang fight. I put it in park, lit the thing up, made them think the cavalry arrived, and I bailed out the passenger side. And and when the when they all scattered, there were two bodies in the in the parking lot. I mean, it was violent, a lot of violence. So, can you talk about the four corners of death for the for yeah. the audience? Yeah. So I I liked Twenties Beat, which was the bar district, and I liked Twenty Ones Beat, which was up uh, on the far northeast corner. Twenty Ones Beat, we'll just call it Division and Euclid. And north of Division and Euclid, because north of Division was San Diego. Uh, north of there, about two blocks, is uh, Imperial in Euclid. And Imperial in Euclid, if you look it up, uh, you can Google it. It's called, you look up Four Corners of Death, San Diego, it'll pop up. And it'll tell you that it was, I don't even remember how many gangs, something like 50 gangs plus all were, that was like a major, it was called the Four Corners of Death because so many homicides occurred there. Uh, when I eventually I went to a dog unit and I remember rolling up there one time in my dog unit, just 
you know, sometimes I'd go up there if it was a little slow and I'd see if I could rustle something up and chase them back into National City, you know, where they'd be in our jurisdiction. Because if I got into it in San Diego and was chasing around, you know, my supervisors say, what the hell are you doing up in, you know, San Diego? Poaching. We used to call it poaching. Because <laughs> we, you know, so I go up there and I'm rolling up there and guys are throwing beer bottles at my patrol car. Imagine that. That's how bold they were. And I had a dog in the car. They're throwing beer bottles. If you, a citizen, were to break down there, what do you think they'd do to you? Yeah. It was a very violent time, a very violent place. A lot of gang activity. Okay, so for the audience, most people think this is an urban legend. Well, Carlos is going to tell a story here that most people aren't going to believe that happened. So tell me the story about uh, smuggling yourself across the border. <laughs> okay. Um, 1979, I believe it was 79, um, it's day shift. And I was, uh, whenever there wasn't a call and I was working on a report or something, I would often park at 18th and Highland on the Northeast side facing the intersection. Cause I could sit there and write my report and look up and I'd watch traffic northbound and I could see the light and, and if I caught somebody running the red light, I'd go after him, write him a ticket, and then go back and consume my report. So I was sitting there when a, when a, we call them detectives are called dicks. Uh, one of the one of the uh, a, a dick unit, two detectives had stopped a car at the I think it was a Circle K at uh, 18th and D. I believe, yeah, I believe I was on 18th. I don't think it was 16th. There's this there's a Jack in the Box on the corner, which I think is 18th. So it's been a while since I've been down there. So 18th Street, I'm there and I hear it go out and I can see them because I'm elevated. And I can see all the way down to 18th and D. So I put it in drive and I start rolling that way. All of a sudden, this car hauls ass and I'm in a pursuit because I'm the mark unit. They're, you know, they're a plane unit. They're driving a, a brown Nova. I'm hauling ass after this cube. We do southbound. We get on, uh, we go down and, we, and somehow we get from 18th. I think we go down Highland, uh, no, National City Boulevard. Then he makes a... a a westbound turning, we get on the freeway uh, southbound 24th Street. And I'm driving a, a Plymouth, uh, no, not a Plymouth. I was driving a then, same vehicle they drive in Smokey and the Bandit. It was a Pontiac Le Mans 400 Enforcer. That thing not only hauled ass, it gripped the road like it was on fucking rails, man. It was a cool city car. It, I mean, it was literally great cornering. It was a four-door version of a Firebird. And so... I'm hauling ass down the freeway, chasing this dude 120 plus miles per hour. And I figure, okay, all I got to do is stay with him. And it comes out, it's a, I don't remember what, what, what if the cops thought we, we had, we had a lot of robberies at a lot of robberies, 211s, you know, always getting 211 calls at 7-Eleven and liquor stores and all that kind of stuff. And so I don't remember if they suspected them of been starting to do that or what, but I was here, I was chasing this dude. And over it comes out, you know, the run the plate as we're running south. It's a stolen vehicle out of Alhambra. So we're, I'm hauling ass, and I'm saying, okay, all I got to do is stay with this guy. It's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We're going to hit the border going south. It's going to be backed up. He's going to have to bail. I'll be right behind him. I'll get out, and I'll, and I'll chase him in a foot pursuit. I'll, you know, I just got to stay with this dude. I stay with him, but I'm concentrating on the driving. And... I, I hit these little bumps in the road as I'm getting close to the border. They're blah, 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 you know, where your tires grow over these, blah, 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 blah. and I'm looking up and I see this walkover bridge, but I'm still, you know, like paying attention to him, waiting for him to come to a skidding stop and haul ass. By the time we hit those bumps, we're, we're down to about 80 miles an hour. And lo and behold, there's one fucking lane open and he goes flying through it. And I'm, if I try to stop, at 80 miles an hour, I'm afraid I'm going to fishtail and kill that Mexican guard, kill me, something. It isn't going to go well. I go through. I go through. He goes through. And now I'm on the other side of the border, and it's an elevated barrier. I can't make a U-turn. I can't, I can't come back. I'm going, and I'm, I'm driving along, and I go down into Tijuana trying to figure out how to get out of here. And I get an unmarked unit, Mexican cop of some kind, badges me, and he says, follow me here. So I said, okay. So we go back and 
there's a like a construction trailer. You know, if it's a job site and you see these these trailers, well, there's a construction trailer on the same side of southbound traffic in New, Mex in New Mexico, right? So we come back, he has me go back. So we go back and I park the unit, Mark unit, out in front of this trailer, but I'm still in Mexico. I can see the border, it's right, right there. And, uh, and they take my gun belt. They don't know it, but I have a 22, I have a high standard 22 mag Derringer in my belt line, but I don't tell them that. And they take me into this trailer and, um, you know, I, I want to cooperate. I figure, well, they'll understand, you know, we're all cops. I'm 21 years old. I'm naive as shit when it comes to that. And they put me in this back room of the trailer with a table and they, and while they're doing whatever they're doing, trying to figure out what to do, I guess. So I'm in the back room where the trailer is at a slant. It's canted. And there's a sliding window there and the window's open. There's no screen on it. And I'm looking, you know, I'm just standing there waiting and look. And I'll go like that. And there's U.S. Customs guys going, going like that. And I go, what the fuck do they know? <laughs> I jump out the window. I haul ass for the border. And I'm over there. He says, man, it's a good thing you came over. He said, the last, that last time that happened to a cop, they held him for three days. I guess a San Diego cop had run the border before. And they didn't give the car back. They kept everything. Well, I'm on the other side of the border. Now the Mexicans are pissed because <laughs> I escaped. <laughs> and I didn't know it, but Ellis was back at the station rallying the troops to come down and rescue me. And according to Ellis, um, Ed Soto, the sergeant, was on board until Milky, the lieutenant, put the kibosh on it and says, you guys ain't going anywhere. God damn it, you're staying here. Did you did you get your car and your and your gun belt back? Uh, the chief went down with a guy named Chico Gonzalez. Uh, Chico um, uh, Chico became the uh, gang DT joined gang detail, and he was also Mexican liaison. He eventually went over the a, a, uh, DA's office as a DA investigator. I think he retired as like a commander or something like that. But Chico uh, went down with the chief, and <laughs> I thought for sure you know, it was a personal weapon gun. I said, "Shit, I'm had to buy all new shit now." Well. They got it back. Ah. The Mexicans gave him the car back. Car was trashed. It blew a rod on the chase. So the car was dead. I got my gun belt back and my gun. So my 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 handgun that I still have, that I have a Model 66, uh, it's been in Mexico. <laughs> and I still have it. So that's the story. Wow. But uh, about a year ago, yeah, about a year ago, maybe two, I was down in National City uh, doing something. And I had to talk to a National City cop. You know, he was there, and I said, hey, I used to work down here. And he goes, oh, yeah? Kind of like, yeah, sure you did. And I said, ID 150, because we all have an ID number. And it doesn't match the badge number. People think, oh, it's badge number. This That doesn't mean anything. ID number 150. And he goes, oh. And I said, hey, has anybody run the border lately? He looks at me and goes, that was you? We're talking 40 freaking years. 40 years, they're still talking about it. It's a, it's, it's a good story, though. It's a good story. Oh, my God. So, anyway. So, Carlos, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, just kind of relate to the audience. The dangers of, you know, just being on patrol more than anything. Can you, can you tell the story about the disturbance call and the guy bolting for the door and what happened there? Oh, um, well... There, there was a disturbance call. Again, it was day shift. And uh, I was the primary, and I showed up out there. I was working 23's beat. And um, there was this guy in, in disturbance, neighborhood 415. He'd been drinking. And I already decided he's going to go to jail. But I'm waiting for my cover unit, Jim Kneebone. This guy must have smelled it. Must have sniffed the wind and said... I better beat feet because he hauled ass for the door and I chased him into the house. And we were wrestling in this curved area right near the front door. And I, the house came alive. There were a bunch of people in there. And I had this guy, my arm around his neck and his back to my chest. And people were, guys were punching me on the side. I was using him as, to block the blows. My back was to the wall. And then this woman came out. I could see her in the, 
peripheral of my, and she hit me over the head with an iron. At that moment, I said, I got to get the hell out of here. I hauled ass for the door. I think I lost my radio, but I hauled ass. I ran out of there with my tail between the legs, and I got back up on the street. About that time, Kneebone shows up and says, hey, you're bleeding. I didn't know. You know, I'm looking, and there's all blood down my shirt because she'd hit me in the head with an iron. He says, what happened? I told him, and he goes, well, let's go back in and get him. <laughs> so we did. Da, 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 da. We both went back in there. House came alive again. We were wrestling around with this dude on the floor. And this, and, and this woman comes behind me and she's trying to yank my gun out of the holster. I carried a, it was a, it was a break front style called a judge, which the sheriffs issued. And uh, since they issued it and we were wearing it, you know, it was part of the training. So I, I had a judge and it was a good holster. And she was trying to yank it out and I just whacked her with the fist. And Kneebone was the senior officer. She said, put out 1199. So I put out 1199, officer needs help. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, it was Chula Vista, Sheriff's, Astria, National City, all, you know, coming from the station. And, and uh, you know, it all got resolved. And that was that story. Yeah. So, but in, in terms of that story, that was kind of a learning lesson that you, I guess, translated to another incident. And, you know, basically the guy, almost the same type situation, but in this situation, you learned from that one. Yeah. And what happened in that one? Well, let me tell you, uh, just probably tell you that a little bit of that. When I say violent, uh, we had a guy, um, I won't get into names, okay. but a cop, he was, he'd been in several shootings. And one night uh, there was a pizza joint, I think it was a uh, Domino's, that was robbed and both guys were armed. They came out, he iced them both, killed them both. And that night I was, uh, had a guy stopped up on the freeway. My brother was with me. And another cop rolled up with a pizza. And so we ate pizza on top of the hood of the police car up on the, on the shoulder of the freeway. It's because Domino's, or I think it was Domino's, it was a pizza joint, all, you know, a delivery joint. They were giving us free pizzas for two weeks after blowing those two dudes away. And, and so the violence was that level. So that's my point. Mm -hmm. That shootings were not that uncommon. Robberies, guns, a lot. And so there was a 7-Eleven store at uh, Plaza and Harbison. And I was just down the road a bit in a parking lot. And I can't remember if I was, why I was there. I don't know if I was just stopped watching. Sometimes I would just stop and listen. Get out of the car, turn the engine off, listen, whatever. But I was sitting in the car. I remember I was sitting in the car. And, I, and I'd rolled that 7-Eleven. I'd rolled there before one night. And I came through and, and I, there was a car with the license plate covered, the rear plate. And there were two guys in the car. Uh, short story there was I got out, contacted them. They they were both armed. They were going to do the 7-Eleven. Sheriff showed up. They'd already committed two robberies in the, in, in the county. They were just going boom to boom to boom. This was going to be their third one. And this was a 7-Eleven at Plaza and at Harbison. So I already knew history there at Plaza and Harbison. So I'm sitting in this street and I hear this car hauling ass. Maybe it was a pickup truck, but I heard this car hauling squealing tires and all that shit coming from the direction of the 7-Eleven. And they turn a fast turn up, up the street, and there's always a delay from the alarm. So I said, it's rare that we see the guys leaving. You usually get a call and you're searching, and, and you know, a mile a minute was what they tell. Every minute goes by, you have to anticipate your suspect could be a mile away, mile a minute. So I went after them, and they pulled into a, into a house thing, and I didn't know what I was dealing with, these two guys. And... I said, hey, I want to talk to you. I had the dog unit at the time. And he says, uh, you know, what for? I said, hey, I just want to talk to you. Come on over here. So I say to his partner, his, uh, his a passenger, I go, hey, why don't you talk some sense into your friend? They look at each other and Patrick says, I don't, I don't tell my friends to do what to do. I don't tell them to do anything. So with that, driver goes for the front door. I still know what I'm dealing with. And cover is on the way, but... I don't want to, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to lose this guy in the house. I don't want, I don't want anything, you know, right now I need to make a decision. I just went after the driver. I knew the passenger was going to be behind me from, you know, from the, the side, around the side of the house. But I went up to the driver. I said, hey, I said, I wanted to talk to you. And right then he pushed the door, the doorbell. He says, what the fuck for? He got to about, oh, and four. And I came down on his right collarbone because I carried my stick in my left hand. 
I came down on his collarbone like I was, you know, pounding a nail through thick wood. And I and he dropped because I was not going to relive the prior experience where the house came alive. I figured if somebody comes to that door, and I'm anticipating somebody will, otherwise he wouldn't be ringing the doorbell. If they see him down, that might temper the situation a bit. So the other guy comes around the corner, I'm going to kill your dog. So he's down, handcuff him, leave him laying there, because he's not going to go anywhere, and and go back around, and my cover shows up. Anyway, we dealt with it. It was, they did, but it was it was a grab and dash. They, they stole a case of beer. It wasn't armed, but they did rip off the 7-Eleven, so I wasn't like out of tune on what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anyway, I get back to the station, and Tom Deese, the lieutenant, said, uh, well, I think we're going to eat this one. I said, Tom, if it happened tomorrow, I'd do the same damn thing. I'm not out there to, to get my ass beat, you know. I mean, I thought what I did was pretty legit. So, But National City at that time, they really uh, stood behind the cops. Yeah, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about what you had mentioned to me uh, earlier, which was that hesitation, that hesitation that other departments had, in particular San Diego, uh, you know, w- because they were not backing their officers, maybe, yeah. uh, is, is the better way to say it, was leading to officers getting killed. Can you kind of relate that a little bit? Well, at the time when I first went on, average cop in San Diego had, was six months experience. And um, they, they carried 38s, uh, I think with lead nose. I'm not really sure about that, but they were 38 rounds. Uh, they carried no shotguns. Uh, they had no dog units, and um, they were very PR oriented. Uh, and they investigated any time the cop, if I'm remembering right, any time the cop pulled his weapon, they had to write a report on it. There were plenty in 1986. There were more cop killings in San Diego per capita than anywhere in the United States. San Diego cops had the highest death rate in police agencies per capita, per population distribution, anywhere in the United States. And so, yeah, they were, they were, I mean, I went to like six funerals with these guys. Two of them were, two getting whacked at, the, at, the, at a time. Ebeltoff and Tiffany got whacked over a rose, rose bush argument at somebody's house. That didn't have anything to do with hesitancy. They were sniped, but, but yeah, it was very violent. A lot of cops in, and San Diego then shifted over. They got dog units. They went to nine millimeters. They, they, they were, they changed their whole notion. Yeah. Uh, their whole. I don't know if they support the cops, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, if there's a complaint, but back then there was a lot of hesitant hesitancy. I would say by San Diego cops to to take action because their administration was kind of hammering them. For... Yeah, their administration was more. Um, they, they, they were more supportive of the public than they were the cops. That was my, my outside observation. Mm. Whereas as long as you told the truth um, to our administration, as long as you didn't lie, if they, if they called you in to question you, you better assume they already know the answers. They're not calling you to find out. They're calling to find out whether you're going to lie. <laughs> you better just tell them the truth, whatever happened. So I knew, oh, shit. You know, it, as long as you told the truth, they would cover you because that's all they wanted to know was that they could trust you. Yeah. And that, that was key. Yeah. So Carlos, during your career, I mean, basically 77 to 86 with national city PD, you, 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 or yeah. So 86, 87, yeah, 87. Okay. So you're on patrol and then you go to canine and crime suppression. So why do you decide at some point that you want to run a dog? Well, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't, I, I was a patrol boy. When I was in the sixth grade, I wanted to be a patrol boy. You know, we didn't have safety patrol. We had patrol boys and a, a wore a, you know, a, a yellow, uh, they had a certain derogatory term for it, but these yellow little hats, you know, that were the military style split, you know, you would split and they'd lay flat in your hand and wore those and your rank would be on there. You know, if you're a corporal or some shit on the hat and, uh, and we had sergeants, and I liked all that. And we had a little badge, and we wore red sweaters and white pants and a white shirt and everything. We stood out there and stopped traffic for so people could safely cross the road. I, I, I liked that. And, and so 
the the safety patrol office, the, the cop liaison through San Diego PD, they took us to the San Diego PD range and we watched a sheriff demo his dog. And I thought, holy shit, that's super cool, man. I would love to work dogs. Well, when I got with National City, I didn't know they had dogs, but they did. So when an opportunity came up to be a dog handler, I said, I'm going to jump on that. So I became a dog handler. Um, and, and the other guy was going to, um, I think he was going to NTF, Narcotics Task Force. And so when he left, I, I just got his dog. How, back then, it, was it a dual purpose dog? Was it a bite dog as well as narcotics dog? How did that work? No, no, they were just, they were just uh, enforcement dogs. Okay. You know, they could, we'd use them for searches. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had a commercial burglary or something, you go and say, hey, turn off the air conditioning units because you want the air circulating. Um, hey, come on out or we're going to release the dog. You kind of did that to try to get the person to have anxiety and their body would produce an odor that would, the dog would detect better. And so the dog was a search dog, but uh, he was also just an enforcement dog, you know. Yeah. And I'm assuming you probably develop a pretty tight bond with that dog. Yeah. Yeah. It was a learning process. <laughs> it was a learning process. That dog, that dog. He, he always liked to hang his legs out the window. And I tried to break his habit. I hung his leash from the shotgun. And, you know, so I get in. I go, no, no. But he was a big dog. He was over 100 pounds. He's a big thing. And I was hurting my shoulder. So one night I'm on a call and I'm hauling ass eastbound on 8th Street. And there's a unit behind me. And we make a left-hand turn and go up the hill. And I hear this sound. Sounds like a, sounds like a, a, a pellet going through a straw. And a glance over, a dog flew out the window. And he's sliding down the street on his on his back. And the unit behind him, there were no other cars. The, he picked up the dog and, and rolled up to me. He, he skinned his chin, he's, you know, bare skin. And the rest of the night, he wouldn't go near the freaking window. He never did that again. Well, he, he just jumped out the window? No, he, we were in on the corner. He was hanging out the window. Oh. I couldn't break him from doing this. He put his paws out. Because he loved to hang his head out. He hated motorcycles. Anytime we go back, ow, 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 ow. He was going from window to window, barking and wow. And, but he'd always put his paws out. So if I went around a corner, he'd fly. You know, oh, I, my gosh. I, I, it wasn't safe, but I couldn't break him from doing it. Did he it. ever do it again? Never did it again. That whole night, he wouldn't go near the damn windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, one night, I lived in Nasty City for a bit uh, with a girlfriend at the time. And I get a call on the station. And we're like two miles from the station. I get a call. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and she says, Carlos, are you working tonight? I go, no. I go, well, Gunner is. He's down here in one of the cars. He won't let anybody near it. I go, what? I went outside because he slept in a doghouse outside. When I say he was gone, he jumped the fence and went to work. <laughs> I had to go down and get him. <laughs> okay, so what, what about the crime suppression unit? What, what did that, that do? What did you do there? Okay, so that was, um, uh, that was a plain clothes thing. We had to deal with the mile of cars. We'd change cars like every week or two. Uh, we had portable radios in the back. We had baseball caps, sunglasses, different shirts and stuff. And um, it was a selective enforcement unit. Um, we did everything from, we'd go come in and check the booking log. If someone had been picked up for uh, health and safety code, H&S 11550, which is a, a hype charge, you know, maybe a heroin addict, we'd run them and see what their background was. Oh, this guy's a burglar. In one case, it was a burglar. So we called the sheriff. Hey, you guys uh, in National City, you, you guys still got this guy in custody? Yeah. Hey, can you let us know when he's going to be when he's going to be released? Yeah. So we go down to the jail and we follow him. We follow. We follow. We followed in particular this guy. We followed him for a few days. He cased a couple places, and then we grabbed grabbed him, doing a, a residential a resburg, a residential burglary, and the house backed onto a parking lot of a church. And I know it was Sunday because church was letting out. When this guy, I looked over the wall, he was in the bedroom. I could see him through, through this sliding glass door. He was in the bedroom. He, he like doing a Santa Claus act. He had all this stuff on the, on the bedspread, and he four-cornered the bedspread, put it over his back, and was heading for the wall. He came over the wall, and I took him down in the parking lot. <laughs> so we did that. Um, we'd, we'd, they'd, they'd target somebody. I had a, a Navy ID, went to NIS, got a real Navy ID, uh, that took a little bit of effort because they didn't like giving me a real military ID, but it was fake. And I would carry marijuana cigarettes because, you know, it's illegal. Carry marijuana cigarettes, 
fake Navy ID and this and 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 city would give me cash. And I we'd target somebody or just go in and go in and hang out at the Westerner or these nasty little bars, go hang out and buddy up to these guys. And I'd do dope deals, uh, put together uh, arrangements to buy stolen property, find out, just find out who's doing what, you know, because that, that's what I would do. And uh, so that was, that was crime suppression. It was selective enforcement. Or we had a, we had a, a guy who was doing uh, rapes. And um, we set up on him. Uh, we caught him at the 7-Eleven Harbison and some side street. It was a little weird location, but it was very quiet and dark over there. And uh, the lieutenant, we took him down before he went in because we didn't want to have something happen to the clerk. But we did, we did that kind of stuff. It was just selective enforcement. Hmm. Um, it, it was fun. I don't want to do it forever, though. I'm sure it was. It, it, you know, I, I don't know how the DEA guys do it. I mean, these, these, uh, these, because uh, it got to the point where, well, two things happened. One, these guys are talking, you know, we're shooting pool in a, in a dive bar, drinking beer, shooting pool. And these guys are talking about their kids' birthdays, Christmas, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, I don't know, these guys ain't so bad. <laughs> and, but at the same time, every time I do a dope deal, I'd go, is this the time they really know who I am? I, I, I said, you know what? I want to wear the uniform. I want to have the badge. I want you guys to know who I am. I want, to, I, I, I want, I want that. I don't want this pretend stuff. I, so I said, okay, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to go back to patrol. Yeah. Okay. So, so Carlos, I, I want to take a little, a little change with you because I think it's very unique what you ended up doing, which is eventually you, you stop being a, a police officer and you decide at some point you're going to go get your law degree. Why? Well, I had the I only used a part of the GI Bill uh, to finish my undergraduate, which I did part time when I was in the PD. So I still had the GI Bill, and um, and I saw a lot of guys go out on medicals. I saw I saw very few guys retire from longevity. Hmm. Um, I saw and I thought if you don't have something else to do. And you go out. I mean, I saw some guys go out, good cops, and there was just no room for them. National City is a spar- small department, so uh, there's no limited duty full time position. Those are clerks, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Cops are out on the street, and and so um, I had the GI Bill. I I thought, well, I, I grew up. Another thing I grew up watching was Perry Mason. I thought Perry Mason was cool, so I thought, yeah, I'd love. I, I could do Perry Mason, you know. So. I applied to law school and I got accepted. And then uh, I decided, you know, I'm going to stay on the PD. I'm going to work another year so that when I do go to law school and I get out, I won't have any debt. So I, I called and I said to the school, hey, this is McGeorge up in Sacramento. I said, hey, can you defer me a year? And they, yeah, yeah, sure. So it was not too much longer after it was in the summer. I got a call from the dean of students. He says, hey, we'd like to offer you a scholarship. I go, scholarship. I said, you know, I'm a cop, right? I mean, I'm not like a student with no money. I mean, I'm, he goes, yeah, 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 we know. Well, it was a full ride scholarship. And what I learned later was it was, I was not the original guy. There were two guys selected. And as they draw, as the year drew near to them, school year starting, one of them had been accepted to Stanford. Well, when he was accepted to Stanford, he, he, turned down the, the scholarship. So they had this open seat and they had to fill it. They had to fill it in order to, because the, the federal government would give them the money for all three years, but they couldn't give it to somebody in the second or third year. It was a three-year deal. So they, they said, well, I said, but why me? You know, I'm a cop, I'm a C student, I'm this, that. They said, well, basically they were, they were in a bind. Uh. And and they looked at my record because I said, but I'm a C student. I went to National University. Why are you giving me a scholarship? He goes, well, we looked at your record. We saw that you'd been in the military. We saw that you'd be a cop. We knew you'd do it. And I said, well, it was hard. <laughs> I, I remember the, after the first class, I called my mom. And I said, I think I'm in way over my head. <laughs> I don't get this. But they're going to have to drag my ass out. Yeah. You know, I'm going to. I'm going to be gripping the door. So I, when, when you started, did you have a, a, 
did you have a, a goal? What kind of attorney? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. Okay. Uh, I took uh, trial advocacy. I, I, I worked uh, summers at the uh, Sacramento DA's office in their major narcotics unit. Mm -hmm. I, I liked it. Yeah. I liked it. I didn't like, uh, you know, I missed the street. Mm -hmm. I did like being on the street. I liked working my own car at night. I did like it. I loved being being free to, to go out there and sniff up, you know, stuff. Yeah. And, and it was fun. But again, you know, I, I had this opportunity. So I, I, I remember I, uh, after law school, because I broke away and, I, and, and I, I went back, quit the PD. And I was back down visiting and Captain Fowler came to the counter and, and he said, so what are you going to do? Because I graduated. And I said, well, I don't know, get a clerk's job in a law firm. I don't know. And he goes, why don't you come back here? Really? He goes, yeah, I'll talk to the chief. We'll hire you back until you, you know, figure out what you're going to do. I go, shit, benefits, back in the car. So the chief said, all you got to do, you just give me a year. Promise me a year. City council won't hire unless you promise me a year. I said, yeah, give you a year. Man, when the year drew near, I thought, I went to the chief and I said, you know, chief, I'm kind of thinking maybe I'll just stay in police work and, and use it for promotion. He looked at me, he said, he said, um, Chevy, if you don't quit, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> he said, we're all rooting for you, yeah. you know, and, and they gave me time off. Uh, uh, somebody loaned me a long sleeve. Uh, uh, I didn't have, I just had, I didn't have long sleeve in the, in the tie. Some guys had the whole uniform thing. I didn't, I didn't wear those, but they loaned me a long sleeve shirt and a black PD tie. So I could go down for the DA's interview and they, they were all behind me. So I think it was interesting one thing we talked about before was as you work your way to becoming a deputy AG for yeah. uh, the state of California, you actually were a defense attorney for a little while. Yeah. Can you can you talk about that process and, and even the hesitancy of them wanting to hire you because you were a police officer and basically what you told them? Yeah. So I, um, I had applied for the DA's office. And initially I was, I was interviewed, but I didn't get hired immediately. I was on a list and I was at the time working, I uh, went from the PD. I was hired by a law firm that did police, police liability defense for smaller cities on a contract basis. And, uh, it, it also ended up that, you know, if a city had conflict, like let's say San Diego PD had, uh, two cops in the car. Uh, you couldn't have the same lawyer representing the two cops who were both alleged excessive force. Mm -hmm. It'd be a conflict. So the city attorney would represent one cop and they'd farm out the, the rep for the other cop to a private law firm. Well, the law firm I work, went with was doing that for the city, national city. So they hired me to do uh, police liability defense. So I was doing that. And I, I actually worked on Kevin Scott's shooting. He was one of the cops. He was a motor cop. And he was going down the freeway and chasing somebody and ended up having a shooting. And I, I, I worked on that. And, but then they started having me doing all kinds of other stuff, you know, construction defect. It was just all boring. And I said, I don't want to do this. So I applied to the DA's office. I was already on the list. And they called me while I was with the, while I was at the law firm. But I already felt committed to the law firm. I don't want to, you know, these guys hired me. I'm not going to quit. So a few years into the law firm, I said, this isn't my bag. So I applied to the DA's office again, once again on the list. I applied an interview with the public defender and I got an interview and, but in the course of it, I thought, uh, I think these guys are a little concerned cause I was a cop. How could I be a defense attorney? So after the interview, I wrote a follow-up letter and I said, thank you for the interview. Um, I, I, I sensed that there might be some hesitation in hiring me because I'd been a police officer. I said, but what I want you to know is that as a police officer, I defended the public as a whole. And as a deputy public defender, I will defend the public one person at a time. And they hired me. And I didn't see black hat, white hat, you know, good guy, bad guy. I saw ethics. And if you're an ethical defense lawyer, John Adams, one of our first presidents, was the first public defender representing British soldiers accused of massacring uh, people in the street. I think it was Boston or Philly. I don't remember what city it was. He was the first one. He took all kinds of shit, too. <laughs> How was your experience as a public defender? Oh, I loved it. I thought it was good. Good lawyers, um, some zealots, you know, some true believers. Right. I wasn't a true believer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I, I was plain speaking, and, and I think the clients really, uh, they didn't know I'd been a cop. They just, 
I, I would tell them, hey, look, you know, you got charges here. It's like six bullets and a gun. Uh, they're charging you with this one. Now, you, when you, what you want to tell me is whether any of these, some of these are going to kill you and some are just going to hurt a lot. And some might hurt a little. What about these? And let's see if, you know, maybe we can settle on the one that'll hurt a little, but only if it happened. Yeah. And I'd have them tell me the story. And I'd say, look, I'm, I'll do whatever you want. We'll go to trial. You want to settle. But I'm going to be you with an education and experience. I'm not going to tell you what to do because at the end of the day, you're going to be in custody. I'm going to go home for dinner. And the last thing I want you is motherfucking me while you're in the jail. Yeah. That I sold you out. You're going to tell me what to do. And in the end, I swear so many of them just said thank you because I gave them, I feel like I gave them the power to make a decision on their own. And, and I, I, I liked it. I like yeah, that's being, a really that's a really interesting perspective to just go. You tell me. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So once you become a deputy attorney general, what kind of things are you working on? I think I think you and I spoke, and would you say that working on prison stuff was kind of your specialty, or did you just? Well, when I was first hired, I uh, I, I was working prison cases, and these prison cases were uh, most often they were civil cases brought by. Um, inmates for violation of their Eighth Amendment uh, right against, uh, 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 what is it? Um, Cord bread? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's cruel and unusual punishment. Cruel and unusual punishment was their thing, Eighth Amendment. Imagine these guys are in prison. They don't have anything to do. They got their whole lives ahead of them. <laughs> so I, I, I dealt with everything from uh, not enough peanut butter on my jelly sandwich to uh, a guy getting, getting glazer rounded, you know, in the back of the head. Uh, because he got the the, the, the the nightstick away from one of the uh, uh, correctional officers and he was beating the shit out of him up on landing and the, and the other officer in the in you know the there's this window inside the housing unit where they have a rifle in there and the rifle's loaded with glazer rounds they won't ricochet off the concrete they just sort of break up I don't know what they're made of but on soft flesh it'll rip it open so he hit him twice behind the ear the whole thing was laid open and so I would handle those cases, and, and a lot of them I'd been every every every, every prison from uh, I forget the, the the most southern prison here in uh, in Otai, but Sentinella is down here, I believe, and then uh, Pelican Bay all the way up uh, Crescent City, in the most northern part of California. I'd been in half the prisons in the state, and um, so they involved uh, in that case they involved a lot of. Uh, uh, Aryan Brotherhood, Mexican Mafia, Nuestra Familia, Black Gorilla Family, a lot of that kind of stuff. Dealt with, uh, you know, secreting weapons into the prison, a lot of that stuff. So I wanted to transition from that. There was an opening in a uh, healthcare fraud unit. And so I wanted to do that. And um, uh, so they said, okay, uh, but we want you to do six months in LA. Can you do six months? We've got a case we're working up there. And I said, yeah, I can do that. So I go up there and I'm living out of a studio apartment with a blow up air mattress, a cardboard box on which is a, a, a little portable TV with, I think, rabbit ears or something and, uh, and a fold out little chair. And I'd go and I and I was up on uh, uh, Grand and I'd go down uh, the steps near Angel's Flight through uh, Grand Central Market to the to the Ronald Reagan building, which is a state building. And I remember I got up one morning and 9-11 happened. I didn't know it was 9-11. I thought it was a weird, you know, Saturday Night Live had a weird sense of humor. And I turned the TV on and I was watching this thing crash into a building, I thought. Is this fucking Saturday Night Live? What is this? And then the second plane hit. And I'm going, oh, shit. So I go down, I, I go down, I go to the, the office. And, you know, they're already dealing with, with it. And... Um, I get a call. I don't know if it was that day or the next day. I think it was that day. I got a call from the U.S. attorney who, because when I went up there to work the case, it was a U.S. attorney FBI case. And we were their backup because I had two teams, two teams of agents who would go out and execute search warrants in their, in their Batman suits, MP5, sub, MP5 submachine guns, Benelli M4, auto shotguns, 40 cal Glocks. You know, they were all duded up and all blacked out. And... Um, so I had two teams of those guys. And, and um, so the U.S. attorney called and says, er, 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 we're out of here. Every FBI agent in the nation is, is going to anti-terrorism, dropping everything else. So it's your case now. 
we were it was an it was a Russian organized crime case. Uh, there was an office that was wired for sound and video. There was a car the informant drove. Who above him there was, uh, over his side was a camera looking at the passenger who would get in the car and talk. And we were listening and watching. And um, so that's what I ended up doing. And you know a lot of work out of West Hollywood, which is where the Russian mob would hang out. And um, a lot of mu Russian, Armenian, to a lesser extent, Pakistani involved in organized crime. Those are the three. And I got to I got to work in and around a lot of um, law enforcement agencies, LAPD, LASO, IRS, Secret Service. And I'd, I'd attend at the time, they didn't change the name, although I don't think it was still the Soviet Union in 2001. They had attend meetings at the U.S. Attorney's Office, socket meetings, Soviet Organized Crime Intelligence Task Force. And an agent would go, one of my agents would go with me, and he was retired LAPD Asian gangs. And we'd sit there and talk about Russian mob, guys in L.A., coming from wherever, Yakuza. We, had, we talked about all that stuff. It was really eye-opening and, and very interesting. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed that experience. Carlos, how did, being a, how did being a police officer, law enforcement officer, help you, or maybe it didn't help you, but uh, relate that to becoming an attorney? Oh, it helped a lot. It helped a lot. I, I could read between the lines in police reports. I, 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 I could read between the lines. I go, why isn't this in there? I mean, what? This sounds, something's missing. Yeah. Um, I used to go with the agents. Uh, most of the attorneys uh, wouldn't leave the office. They had no field experience. I would go out with the agents, uh, observe, when they were doing surveillance, I'd go with them. When they were executing search warrants, I would go. Uh, they, you know, they'd, they'd secure the, secure the premises because I would like to do three. Uh, if there was a business, a home, and a bank, execute all three locations all at the same time because there was often there was often a safe deposit box. Like in the freaking movies. There's an often a safe deposit box with passports and cash and shit like that in their bug out money. So you want to hit the bank. You don't want you don't know where they're going to be. And if you don't get them at any one location, you don't want them getting to money and, and passports. Yeah. You want to lock them down. So uh, we do that, and and having been a cop, I, I I would go I would go to the crime scene, and it may not have been our search warrants were written so that so that there wasn't anything that could be excluded. It would say we're looking for this or anything that blah blah blah, and so I'd go through and I would see stuff, and I'd go grab this too, I'd see these boxes or I'd see that I'd grab that, I would see things you know because the agents aren't thinking like I'm thinking. But as a cop, you know, I'd been to, I'd been to crime scenes with detectives, uh, homicide scenes and so forth. And the detectives say, okay, you know, walk in the room this way. You learn along the way. And so uh, it was very helpful having been a cop. Yeah, I, and I, I got to imagine the detectives and agents that you're out there with as an attorney, I, I always loved having the, the, you know, AUSA or DA with me. It was like, Hey, these guys got a vested interest in this. I mean, there it's it's kind of that partnership that I always enjoyed. Yeah, there were there were a couple agents I really like working with too. So there were times when, hey, you want to go? I mean, uh, I I could drive up on my own, but you drive, and then the supervisor got on got on me. Hey, you know, these agents got other shit to do besides going with you. <laughs> I go, well, you know, yeah, I enjoyed hanging out. Yeah, no, absolutely, it was fun. Okay, so last two questions I always ask Carlos. Um, first of all. Did being in law enforcement affect your family? Um, well, I don't know. I'm twice divorced, so I don't. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I mean, do you think? Do you think? Well, twice divorced. Do you think that the a couple things like time time on the job was it was it a thing where you enjoyed police work so much that it kind of interfered with your marriage? I mean, or it was just totally well. The first different. the the first uh, I don't know I. I don't know the, the, what police work interfered with the first one, but uh, I would say not really for the most part during the first, uh, uh, when I was a cop, I was single, you know, pretty mm -hmm. much mostly. And I was without children. It wasn't until I became a lawyer, you know, the second time around, but I was, I was still working a lot. And when I was up in LA for 14 months, I was, I was gone a lot. Um, uh, the thing with the uh, AG's office is that, um, I worked on cases where they were pretty serious people, and and uh, I'd received some uh, death threats along the way, and 
there was a time when agents would go with me because of those threats. And I carried a nine millimeter uh, as a, as a, I wasn't law enforcement. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, uh, a gun toting law enforcement, but I was a, a lawyer carrying a, a, with a concealed weapons permit. Hmm. And, and so there was always that, you know, um, concern because some of these people, they, they'll go after your dog, you know? So um, nothing ever happened. And, you know, I've been out of it now for several years, but, um, there was always that, that concern, you know, once you're tied to other people, um, beyond your control, if it's just me, I can, you know, I can, I can handle myself, but I can't, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, it, it was bothersome having other people, family members potentially exposed to stuff you're doing. How about this? What was over the course of your career, did your attitude toward people in society change? I mean, you, you saw a lot of violent stuff when you were officer and dealt with some pretty bad guys as a as an attorney. Did did that ever change, or did you just kind of maintain the same perspective? Um, you know, when I, yeah, <clears throat> people do things uh, at all different levels. You know, nobody's. Uh, to coin, you know, to use a religious term, no one is without sin, so to speak. So it it just made me aware that I'd seen so many things that I knew that anything you can conceive in your mind, humans are capable of doing. When I was with a de defense attorney, just this one thing, I handled one kid, kid, I say kid, he was a young guy. I was uh, working with another lawyer on this case. Um, he killed his whole family, five. Mother, father, grandparents, and then drove his, his sister, his younger sister, to the hardware store where he bought the axe that he went back to the house and killed her with. <laughs> this dude was, he was Jason, you know, the movie Friday the 13th, that, that was, he was the real deal. And so I just, it, it's just seeing a lot of different things, you know, that people are capable of anything, right. anything and everything. Nothing would surprise me. And that's, you know, that's, I, are, they're good people, bad people, but people are capable of anything. That's what I walked away with it. That's what I walked away with. Carlos, I appreciate the interview. Thank you very much. It was fun.